gate of CRIM 103. For this week, we're going to be focusing on the relationship between mental disorders and offending. So we'll talk a little bit about what mental disorders actually are, how we define them, how society has responded to them. We'll talk about three mental disorders that have been particularly important for involvement in offending and the intersection with the criminal justice system. Talk thirdly about the mechanisms that relate mental disorders to offending. So why do we see an overrepresentation of persons with mental health disorders within the justice system? And then lastly, we'll talk about the intersection between the justice system and mental health disorders. So what is the difference between someone who's been found not coming responsible on account of mental disorder versus unfit to stand trial. Before we talk about any of that, just as a quick reminder, do not use Wikipedia for your term papers. The reason why is that Wikipedia is an editable source, so other people can go in there, change facts, rewrite things, and so on. What you can do is, when sources are cited in Wikipedia, there'll be little links at the bottom, go to those links, find out if they're reliable or not, and you can use those sources for your term paper. We have a problem in the social sciences, well, in all sciences as well, with a lack of reliability of actual papers and actual journals. There are what we call predatory journals that will send emails to scholars. So uh, these are emails that I received several years ago, but I still get this type of email. I get dozens of these emails every week where they're asking, they'll use terms like, oh, Dr. Evan McCush, your eminency, and all these like really weird terms to try and suck up to you and say like, you're such an amazing scholar, we want you to publish in our journal. And these aren't peer-reviewed journals or predatory, they'll ask for like a publishing fee once you've written the paper and submitted it to the journal, and they have a very poor standard for peer review or no peer review whatsoever. So the papers published in these journals are completely unreliable. The people who submitted to the journal either were maybe like they're, they're new researchers and didn't understand that it was a predatory journal or they were really unethical researchers. So we have this phenomenon in all of like academia called publisher pair. If you are a professor, so remember there's an assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. As an assistant professor, my ability to get hired as an associate professor is almost like 100% predicated on my ability to publish research. Unethical assistant professors might publish in these unethical journals as a way to boost up their CV to show that they have a lot of publications when in reality these are really kind of fraudulent. So if you're concerned about whether or not you have a fraudulent paper or you are looking at a paper from a predatory journal, just contact myself or contact your TA and we can help you figure out if it is or is not a predatory journal. Before we get started thinking about how mental disorders relate to offending or how the justice system treats persons with mental disorders, we need to really begin to get towards the core ideas of what a mental disorder is. And for centuries, really, there was no attempt by science to really develop universal standards for how to define and measure a mental disorder. And this became a really big problem because, especially by around like the 1950s, 1960s, we really wanted to begin to get an understanding of what is the prevalence of schizophrenia? How many people in North America have depression? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, disorders basically said here is how we want practitioners in North America to define whether this particular mental health disorder is present or absent. So the DSM basically showed us how to define mental health disorders. In Europe, they use the International Classification of Disease, or the ICD. The DSM and the ICD are very, very similar. Now, we think about mental health disorders along a continuum. So we try to avoid putting people into like boxes. This allows for that gray area where we can ultimately define a mental disorder if all of these particular symptoms are present. But we try to think in terms of the sort of scale or degree of a mental disorder as opposed to these clear like categorical distinctions of mental disorders. So that's why we call the DSM a dimensional approach to mental health measurement. What is actually the definition of a mental disorder? So for the DSM, 
be talking about a pattern of behavior or thinking style or processing that impacts our function or coping with life. So it's not just that this behavioral pattern exists, it's that it actually impairs our functioning in day-to-day -day life. The presence of a mental health disorder cannot be due to developmental or social norms. In different cultures, there are different standards of behavior, and we have to make sure that when we're assessing mental health disorders in different cultures, we're sensitive to these differences in norms. A mental disorder cannot be directly caused by a physical impairment or a disease. The DSM will do is consider the role of how cancer can lead to depression. So if somebody has been diagnosed as being terminally ill, that can have a very severe effect on a person's way of thinking about the future. And so that could lead to things like depression. Presence of cancer is not in itself a mental disorder, but how it influences depression is something that we really need to take into consideration. So we need to think about how physical health can impact mental health. To summarize, mental health disorders is a problem with how we act or think. Intellectual disabilities technically are in the DSM, but they're not considered a mental disorder because they are something that is believed to be, for example, a result of an organic brain injury. We hear a lot more about mental disorders and the prevalence of mental disorders in Canada, especially when we're thinking about young people, school-aged people in high school who, the prevalence of depression in high school is really high. So we need to ask ourselves the question of why do mental disorders appear to be more prevalent in Canada now compared to Canada 20 or 30 years ago? Is it that more people are getting mental health disorders? Are we living less healthy lifestyles that is more conducive to developing mental health disorders? Or are we more aware of mental health disorders? And I think this latter point is a really big part of why mental disorders in Canada appear more prevalent. We have programs like Hashtag Bell Let's Talk where we're becoming more open about talking about the experiences of mental health disorders. Tyler Mott from the Vancouver Canucks talked extensively about his battles with depression. Tyson Fury, who's a heavyweight champion of the world in boxing, has gone through a lot of problems with depression. I think he may have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And we need to have these conversations, it's very important that we do, but in doing so, it might give us the perception that mental health problems are now more common than they were in the past and it might be difficult to ever actually know why mental health disorders appear more prevalent because we didn't do a good job of talking about mental health problems in the past. Another reason why mental health disorders may appear more prevalent is the role of politics. So especially in the 1960s in Vancouver, this is sort of when it started, but it carried on to the 1980s at least. So in the 1960s, when psychotropic medicines began to be developed, we could now use pills to treat people instead of housing them in hospitals or psychiatric facilities. There was a movement towards deinstitutionalization. So take people out of these hospitals and place them in the community. This became especially prevalent during Margaret Thatcher's era in England and the Reagan era in the United States where there was a really big effort to reduce social programs like psychiatric facilities. So many psychiatric facilities were closed and patients were moved into the community. The plan was to create community-based outpatient facility. An inpatient facility is like a psychiatric hospital where the individual will receive their treatment while residing in that same facility. Outpatient facility is where an individual will attend a specific facility in the community to receive their treatment, but they don't reside at that institution or in that building. They have their own home that they live in. So the plan was to provide individuals with these psychotropic drugs, but then also have the facilities in the community where they can go to get mental health counseling and treatment. I don't think you'll be surprised to hear that they actually never ended up building these resources in the community. So basically, individuals were only treated through psychotropic medicine, and that's why we can see such a high prevalence of individuals with mental health problems living in the downtown east side. So Vancouver, more it's like more accurately Coquitlam, right off of Lougheed Highway, there was, there was Riverview Hospital. In the 1960s, this hospital housed over 4,000 patients. So imagine this, 
In the 1960s, we're less aware of what a mental health disorder is. We're less aware of what the symptoms are. We're less inclined to talk about it. So those 4,000 people were likely the most severe forms of persons living with mental health problems. Not like what we would see today. Think about how many people that is with these more severe forms of mental health problems. By the 1990s, the number of beds in Riverview Hospital was 350 people. So we had reduced the number of people living in this hospital by about 4,000. Where do these people go? Well, that's why we see part of the big issues that we see with the downtown east side. So basically the Mental Health Act in the 1960s said, we'll treat mental health just as importantly as physical health, but we will treat it in the community as opposed to having these hospitals. But there was never this proportional increase in community facilities to help provide the care for released patients. So let's talk a little bit about the DSM. I mentioned before that it was developed basically to assess for the prevalence of mental health disorders in North America, and we define these mental health disorders under the DSM as dimensional, so they exist along a spectrum of degrees of the mental health problem as opposed to categorical models of mental health. It's not quite that simple either. So the DSM is organized into five levels, which we refer to as axes. I would say most importantly for the purposes of this class, are axis one and axis two mental disorders. Axis one disorders refer to sort of our classic clinical psych disorders and include schizophrenia, major depression, phobia, substance use. Axis two refers to mental disorders and what they use as a term of mental retardation for persons with learning disabilities and so on. For axis one, there's much more optimism about treatment. For axis two, less optimism about treatment. Personality, especially in adulthood, is considered relatively stable. I have some disagreements with this, especially with respect to when we're looking at personality in adolescence, but we'll talk about that for our lecture on psychopathy coming up next week and the week after. But the idea is that personality is developed from temperament and temperament is developed from genetics. So there's less optimism towards treatment around personality disorders, but that doesn't mean we can't treat personality disorders. First, I would say that we can treat personality disorders, but if I sort of set that opinion aside for now and say, okay, we can't treat personality disorders, but what you can still do is treat the individual. So you might not get rid of the symptoms of the personality disorder, but you can find ways to treat that individual, treating the ways in which the personality of the individual leads to actual problems in their day-to-day -day life. Axis four of the DSM refers to factors that can contribute to a mental disorder outside of medical conditions. That's because axis three looks at medical conditions that might be relevant to a mental health disorder. So the goal here is to help psychologists be attuned to the fact that if an individual has cancer, then treating their symptoms of depression might be much different from somebody whose depression stems from the dissolvement of a relationship or the fact that they lost their job and so on. Axis 5 is there to help us assess the patient's level of functioning. So how well do they exist in society? <laughs> So axis 1 and axis 2 are really where we find the definitions of the different mental disorders that we're interested in. For the purposes of this class, we're probably more interested in axis 2 disorders because these tend to be more strongly related to criminal behavior. So these personality disorders include uh, different clusters of disorders. So they talk about cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C. Cluster A disorders are referring to paranoid and schizotypal disorders. Very importantly, and we'll talk about this throughout the class today, there's a big difference between schizophrenia and schizotypal disorders, but we'll cover that later. Cluster B disorders are the ones that we are going to be most concerned with. 
This refers to behaviors or personality disorders like antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder is most likely to be associated with criminal behavior because you literally cannot diagnose antisocial personality disorder amongst persons who have not committed criminal behavior. Only if you're engaging in criminal behavior can you ever be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Other cluster B personality disorders include narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder. Here's how I would explain the difference between narcissism and psychopathy. You may have heard before of the term narcissistic injury. This is where an individual's uh, like ego is injured because somebody doesn't find them attractive or smart or charismatic or something like that. So they can, they can become very upset. They can be, they can have very low self-esteem. Persons with narcissism aren't necessarily people who are really self-confident. Their narcissism can actually stem from that need to have other people validate them. If somebody rejects somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder, they may become the target of violence because of this experience of narcissistic injury. Someone with psychopathy, they might have a higher sense of self or they might just care so little about the opinion of others that they don't necessarily care about whether a person likes them or not. I'm definitely not saying that people with psychopathy who are rejected by others or who experience the end of a relationship aren't going to seek to commit violence against that person. I'm just saying that how they react could be a little bit different from persons that have narcissistic personality disorder. Finally, with cluster C, we'll see things like obsessive compulsive disorder, which aren't necessarily going to be linked to criminal behavior, especially in the absence of other mental health disorders. One of the things that I haven't mentioned yet today, but it's really important, it's a key term to understand, is comorbidity. Comorbidity is where an individual has more than one mental health disorder. And this might sound like it's going to be a quite rare, but it's actually more likely the rule rather than the exception. This means that most people with one mental health disorder tend to also have a second mental health disorder. disorders well more specifically I'll talk about psychopathy so for this week when talking about major mental disorders we'll focus on three disorders from axis one of the DSM major depression schizophrenia and bipolar disorder major depression tends to be a bit more common for women and its onset is typically in the late 20s so that doesn't mean that people only experience this in the late 20s it's just that among the different age groups Major depression is most common for individuals in the late 20s, maybe because this is when most individuals are about to enter their career, get married, have children. Maybe some of these things don't happen or they do happen, but it's not what a person expected or wanted. And so they might feel that there is less opportunity to change or alter their life course. So this is where depression can emerge. The symptoms of depression include sadness, lethargy, which is like not wanting to move around, exercise, go outside, and anhedonia. Anhedonia is basically comes from the word root of hedonistic or hedonist, where somebody who's hedonistic is pleasure seeking. So when you put that A in for, as a prefix, what it indicates is the person is basically lacking pleasure. Schizophrenia is slightly more common in men and the onset tends to happen in emerging adulthood. Emerging adulthood, there's some differences of opinion about which age stages it captures, but starts at age 18 and goes to about age 23, some say 25, others say age 29. The emerging adulthood period is again sort of critical because we can experience a lot of stress during this period, especially for our university students, maybe in their fourth and final year, so they're 21, 22 years old, sometimes older, and you can experience immense stress, final exams, it's sort of your last opportunity to improve your GPA, and these significant stressors are what can create a psychotic break where the manifestation of schizophrenia can occur. Don't tend to see schizophrenia emerge among adolescents, but it can happen. I have interviewed kids who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia 
One of them, his schizophrenia was believed to be a drug-induced schizophrenia. But uh, for most kids, you're not going to see schizophrenia symptoms. It'll be more common in that emerging adulthood stage. And there are different types of symptoms of schizophrenia. When we're talking about positive symptoms, we're referring to delusions or hallucinations. So things that are actually actively happening are being inflicted on the person. Whereas negative symptoms can be things like flat affect. So they're kind of tend to be like emotionally stunted. Remember when we talked about differential association reinforcement theory and we were talking about operant conditioning and positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement? So a positive symptom is the application of the symptom. It is adding something to somebody's life experience. Negative symptoms are kind of taking things away. So like taking away a person's ability to have like positive emotional experiences. I shouldn't have used the word positive there, but you get what I mean, good emotional experiences. Bipolar disorder is relatively equal across men and women. And onset typically happens in late adolescence. Living with bipolar disorder, people will say is like living with two mental disorders because individuals will go through extreme highs, like senses of euphoria, and then extreme lows, where it actually looks like depression. In terms of the prevalence of these disorders, about 7% of the general population has experienced major depression, about 1% schizophrenia, and about 1% bipolar disorder. What's important to note is that bipolar disorder can be especially underdiagnosed, and here's why. Imagine you're experiencing extreme forms of euphoria, so you are really enjoying life. Other people are gonna see you and believe that your behavior is risk-taking or dangerous. People won't necessarily want to go to see a psychologist or psychiatrist or a mental health professional when they are going through these symptoms. They'll believe that they do not need anybody's help. Only when they go through their down cycle and they begin to experience major depression will they want to go and seek a mental, mental health so the mental health professional, if they don't know enough about this person's background, if they're not aware about that euphoric, they're likely to diagnose this person with major depression. So that's why we could have an overestimate of the prevalence of major depression and an underestimate of bipolar disorder because individuals going through sort of the manic euphoric phase of bipolar disorder are less likely to actually seek out treatment. I think one of the ways to help understand something like schizophrenia is also to help you understand what schizophrenia is not. So there's a difference between schizophrenia and paranoia disorders or delusional disorders. Delusional disorders include delusions that are believable or justified. So maybe somebody believes that their neighbor is stealing their mail or that everybody in their workplace is out to get them. These will be false. They're believable something that could happen in reality. So paranoia is about something that could be real. Schizophrenia is about believing that some form of government is sending signals through radio waves to try and tell you to commit a homicide offense, or that aliens are sending signals into your brain telling you to incite a race war. These could be examples of symptoms of schizophrenia. As I mentioned at the beginning of class, there's also a key difference between schizophrenia and schizotypal disorder. Schizophrenia is an axis one disorder. Schizotypal disorder falls under axis two of personality disorders. Personality traits are stable over the life course. So how we are at age two tends to be how we are at age seven, at age 14, 21, 28, 35, and so on. If schizotypal disorder is a personality disorder, it means that the features of this disorder have basically been present since birth. On the other hand, as I mentioned with schizophrenia, we don't tend to see symptoms manifest until someone has experienced sort of that psychotic break. And then they, at age, you know, 18 to 25, or when, symptoms of schizophrenia are going to manifest. So schizophrenia describes a loss of contact with reality. And it can include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech patterns, grossly disorganized behavior, and inappropriate affect. So laughing when things should be sad, not responding emotionally to different life events. So individuals with schizophrenia are in a state of psychosis. 
Most individuals with schizophrenia do not engage in crime. But if you have schizophrenia and another mental health disorder, such as a substance abuse problem, then your risk of offending is really ample. Schizotypal disorder is where individuals have difficulty forming close relationships, playing with others, and they can develop sort of sets of peculiar beliefs, behaviors, sort of social norms. So we have to be careful about how we talk about schizotypal disorder because some of these peculiar behaviors can just be a person's lifestyle decision or a reflection of the gender that they identify with. So what I'm, what I'm saying here, just because I'm listing it as a symptom, does not mean that somebody that engages in that behavior definitely has schizotypal disorder. The reason why I'm practicing this is because one of the symptoms of schizotypal disorder can be cross-dressing. So it has to be more than just one of these particular behaviors. Individuals with schizotypal disorder really might have a preference for non-verbal communication, like they might prefer to be alone, they might prefer to make friends with things like animals, pet rocks, and so on. They tend to be loners, but again, you have to be careful about that. Sometimes I have a preference for being alone. doesn't mean that I have schizotypal disorder. Individuals with schizotypal disorder can be anxious and also have flat emotion. They can experience a psychotic episode, but they can also be swayed back from this delusion. An individual who is in a state of psychosis might be in this state in perpetuity without any treatment or medication. If you're really interested in bipolar disorder, there are a lot of very strong documentaries on YouTube that you can find that can help give you a sense of what individuals experience living with bipolar disorder, especially what their families experience living with, caring about somebody who lives with bipolar disorder. Homeland is a TV show, I forget the, who the actress is that stars in it, but she does also a very strong job of displaying what it's like for somebody to live with features of bipolar disorder. Carrie being bipolar does make her an unreliable narrator. I have never been so sure and so wrong. I think it's interesting to ask the question through her character. Can you be really functional at the same time as having a serious illness? I think the other writers look to me a lot for Carrie's character. She's the character I have the most affinity for, and I know a lot about bipolar illness. There is a bigger, pernicious, Abu Nazir-worthy plot out there, and we have little time. A lot of people that are highly artistic or highly scientific are bipolar, and that hypomanic state is a very productive state. And Carrie does her best thinking in that heightened state. And yet you have to be vigilant about not going too high or falling too far. We have been alerted that something is coming. And, and it all has to do with a certain period in Abu Nazir's life. I have heard from a number of people that said, I've never seen bipolar depicted so accurately. We've done our research. All of us have had experience with it in our families or our friends. So we have the personal knowledge, but we've also really studied. So I made up my mind. I'm grateful for the concern, but I just, I can't live like this anymore. It needs to stop. ECT is actually very effective, and yet there's a great fear about it among many people. They're scared their personality's gonna change. They're scared they're gonna lose their memory. You don't have to let them with your brain. <sighs> My brain's already Yeah, it's a brain I happen to love. It is scary because the truth is, no doctor can tell you why it works. They just know that it works. And that's a leap of faith. We had Carrie make that choice because she was so at the end of her rope. The symptoms of bipolar disorder include experiences of extreme highs that we'll refer to as mania and extreme lows like major depression. So mania is characterized by like extreme, extreme risk taking. So driving really fast, gambling, feelings of euphoria like you're invisible, but also irritation. So agitated needing to constantly be on the move. It's very difficult to tell you exactly how long these manic features, this manic state lasts, but generally speaking, the research tends to say that it 
approximately one week is the average time that individuals live with these mania features and they require very little sleep during this period of time. Depression amongst individuals with bipolar disorder looks exactly like the experience of individuals who have major depression without bipolar disorder, so lethargy, anhedonia. They can also experience anger and irritation, especially if it results from disturbed sleep. Some individuals can go through mixed states where they have a high sense of belief in themselves, but combined with something like suicidal ideation or low self-control combined with depression, so experiencing mania and depression basically during the same time period. For those with bipolar disorder, the manifestations rarely occur within a calendar year. So it's not like an individual experiences the manic phase one week and then depression and then back to mania and then back to depression. These are things that maybe they'll experience one week of the mania features of bipolar disorder out of every 52 weeks and then they are living their life as normal for the rest of that time period. Bipolar disorder implies that an individual has like two sides to this mood and they can move in like a cyclical nature where starting with euphoria and moving into major depression. Hypomania is kind of a milder form of a manic state and lasts about four days, characterized by somebody who speaks very quickly, spends a lot of their money, or has feelings of hypersexuality, increased propensity for abuse can occur with respect to substances. So they may never use drugs, but during this hypomania phase, they begin to use cocaine to amplify these experiences of mania. And the very extremes, mania can actually lead to the person experiencing psychosis. A person is going through one of these episodes, it's not like it's just a more severe extension of their general personnel. They tend to be drastically different from their typical mood or what is typical of that person. So it's not just an amplification. There are also subtypes of bipolar disorder. Bipolar 1 disorder describes mania as the defining characteristic and depression is not necessary for diagnosis. So they might experience that euphoric stage but then not really transition into experiences of major depression. And again, it's very important to reiterate when people hear the word euphoria, it's sometimes something that we would equate with pleasure, like we would want to experience this sense of euphoria. To, but to be very clear, in this like one week phase of mania, an individual is really putting their life at risk or their well-being at risk because they might begin to use drugs very severely They'll do things like gamble, lose all their money, lose their house, lose relationships. So it can be a very damaging experience. Bipolar 2 disorder doesn't really have those extreme features of mania. So they'll see hypomania four days at a time, but then an individual can fall into that state of major depression. So there's a bit of mood elevation with hypomania, but it's not to the same extreme as the mania that we see in bipolar ones. So we'll transition now to the third theme of today's lecture, which is to look at the intersection between mental disorders and offending. And there are different ways to study the relationship between mental disorders and crime. First way is to look at the prevalence of major mental disorders in prison. So it's to go into a custody center and identify what percent of individuals in a prison are characterized by, let's say, either major depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder. And then we could compare the prevalence of mental disorders in prison to the prevalence of mental disorders in the community. So we tend to see that just maybe a slightly over 8% of the community is characterized by a major mental disorder, and yet in prison it's closer to 20% that are characterized by at least one of those three disorders. So then we can say that there seems to be a clear evidence that mental disorders are more prevalent amongst persons involved in crime compared to a general sample of people in the community. Another way to look at the relationship between mental disorders and crime is to look at the prevalence of a history of violence among patients living in a psychiatric facility. Let's say if it was the 1960s, you could go into Riverview Hospital where there are 4,000 patients, 
and we could administer a self-report survey or we could look at their criminal records to see what percent of individuals in these facilities have a history of violence. And then again, we could compare this to the percent of the general population with a history of violence. What we might find is maybe again, around 20% of individuals in these psychiatric facilities have a history of involvement in violence, but in the general population, only about 1% are involved in violence. What we can also do is look at the prevalence of both mental disorders and offending within the general population in the community. So what we'll find is that less than 10% of the community has a major mental disorder. But among those in the community with a major mental disorder, the likelihood that those persons have a history of criminal behavior is higher than when looking at persons in the community without any type of mental disorder. Mental disorders do appear to be associated with crime, but does this mean that mental disorders cause crime? Very important. Again, we talked a lot about stigmatization and labeling in this class. The vast majority of persons with a major mental disorder, about 90% of them, will not engage in violence. We can't ignore the fact that the prevalence of individuals with a mental disorder in custody is higher than the prevalence of individuals in the community with a mental disorder. Why does this exist? One of the reasons might be that when we see the intersection of substance use, or especially substance abuse, with these three major mental disorders, it can greatly increase the risk for violence. The next thing that we want to do is understand why does this relationship between mental health disorder and crime actually exist. And there are different perspectives, and I would say that to this point there's enough empirical research for us to be able to sort of make assertions about which of these perspectives has validity to it. Earlier perspective was that criminalization of mental disorders is why we see a higher proportion of individuals in custody with a mental health disorder. So for example, there was an argument, and I really, I get the, the logic behind this argument of how in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, we saw that experience of deinstitutionalization. Persons with mental health disorders are released into the community and maybe they're experiencing difficulties in the community. As a response, the government decides to arrest people with mental disorders for minor behaviors, put them in prison, and the prison will now serve as that psychiatric facility. We really see the empirical evidence of individuals being criminalized for having a mental disorder without actually having any involvement in criminal behavior. I'm not saying that this never happened, but it's not, it didn't happen enough to fully explain the relationship between mental disorders and its overrepresentation in the justice system. Another but valid explanation of this relationship has to do with police discretion. For example, somebody who's going through the manic phase of bipolar disorder might be belligerent towards police or believe that they aren't going to be arrested or believe that they could run away from police. So the interaction that the police officer has with the person that's a suspect of a crime can influence the likelihood that the police will arrest that person or the likelihood that police will recommend charges to Crown Council and so on. Another perspective is that police officers will recognize here's a person with mental health problems that has engaged in a criminal behavior. Maybe it's not a, an especially serious crime. So often police officers will let people go with warnings. If it's the first time they've been involved in the crime, if they're an adolescent and so on, they might just get a warning if it's a minor criminal behavior. But what if this person who's engaged in, let's say, shoplifting from a convenience store is also going through mental health crisis? So they say that they have suicidal ideation. They're telling the police officer that they're struggling with their mental health problems. A police officer might want to get this person help. They don't want to just release this person because what if they go and commit harm to themselves and the police officer feels like this is my opportunity to do something about this. But they can't take them to Riverview, as an example, because these facilities are closed or they have no available beds. So the police officer might believe that taking them to a custody facility, so incarceration, might be a way to help this person deal with their mental health problems. From a legal standpoint, this isn't the right thing to do at all. A defense
defense lawyer would say, you cannot incarcerate my client, not because of the crime that they've done, but because of their mental health symptoms. This is a protectionist philosophy, and that's not okay from a charter of rights and freedoms perspective. A person has a right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment, and punishing somebody because they're going through mental health problems would fit that standard. So police officers are put in that very difficult situation. And if you talk to people from the VPD, you'll learn that most of their calls to service are actually to help respond to persons dealing with mental health crises rather than criminal behavior. Third perspective that also has validity is the symptom-based explanation. Persons with mental health disorders are more likely to engage in criminal behavior because the symptoms of those mental health problems are risk factors for criminal. This is what we can call a threat control override symptom. So if someone is going through extreme delusions or extreme paranoia, they might respond to a, what would typically be an innocuous situation with violence or with property damage. So these threat control override symptoms are symptoms of the mental disorder that disrupt a person's ability to function appropriately and respond correctly in the right context. So studies of persons with mental disorders in prison have asked such persons to check off boxes indicating why they thought they engaged in this type of crime. And they very often the individual themselves links their crime to their own mental health symptoms. So we are very concerned about positive mental health symptoms. Remember that's something that add something to the person as opposed to negative symptoms that might take away a person's affect or emotions. Positive symptoms for violence include delusions. There are different types of delusions. They include delusions of control, so you believe that somebody is trying to control your thoughts or your mind. Delusions of persecution, so you believe that a specific person or government entity is out to get you. Delusions of grandeur, so maybe you believe that you're Jesus Christ or that you have special power. I have contained my rage for as long as possible, but I shall unleash my fury upon you like the crashing of a thousand waves! Be gone, vile man! Be gone from me! A starter car! This car is a finisher car! A transporter of gods! The golden god! I am untethered and my rage knows no bounds! Delusions of jealousy. So you might believe that maybe a neighbor is having an affair with a person, your, your wife, your spouse, whomever, and delusions of reference, where you believe that certain objects hold certain, certain power or importance. Some of these types of delusions can be especially likely to lead to threat control override symptoms. So again, there's like psychotic symptoms that cause a person to feel threatened and involve some sort of response as a way to try to take back this perspective that others are trying to control thoughts or override your ability to have self-control. Of these different positive symptoms, the ones that are more likely to lead to criminal behavior are delusions of control, persecutory delusions, and delusions of jealousy. So somebody who feels that somebody's trying to control their mind, I will watch a video for this week on Jeffrey Ehrenberg, felt that somebody was trying to control their mind through the airwaves. Nobody was listening to them, so they shot somebody to get attention, to bring attention to their problem. Persecutory delusions, we've seen, this is actually really the origins of why we have things like not criminal response well on account of mental disorder. In England, persons with mental health symptoms thought that the crown monarchy was out to get them. We would see attacks on political figures because the individual felt that the monarchy was out to get them, trying to ruin their life. Another thing that I think is very, very important to acknowledge for why we might see a strong relationship between mental disorders and offending is also because having a mental disorder can lead to other psychosocial outcomes that can also increase risk for offending. So persons with mental disorders are more likely to use substances. They experience lower socioeconomic status. They can experience homelessness, poor education, and go through stressful life events. And all of these things can compound and act as a way to further influence a person's involvement in crime.
gone through this already, but just to reiterate, schizophrenia alone is typically unrelated to offending. But when we see comorbidity between schizophrenia and substance abuse, depression, delusions, all of these things can amplify the risk that somebody with schizophrenia might engage in crime. And again, these delusions can be about control, persecution, jealousy, and these are the ones that we are most worried about in terms of being linked to involvement in criminal behavior. So to summarize, the schizophrenia symptoms that increase risk to violence are those threat control override symptoms. Active psychotic symptom, especially when coupled with a substance disorder. The presence of a delusional belief about a significant other is something that we can be especially concerned about when it comes to intimate partner violence. We'll talk in like the tutorial discussion about another very polarizing case, the case of Vincent Lee, where he had uh, messages being sent to him saying that this young man, Timothy McLean, who was on a bus, was an alien and aliens were here to take over the world, telling him to kill this alien. When the specific delusion or hallucination is actually instructing the individual to engage in violence, that's where we're obviously more likely to see a person engaging in some form of criminal behavior. This might be something that I should have mentioned at the outset, but I wanted to explain why mental disorders are important to criminology students. Because it's true that if you get a major in criminology, or even if you do your master's, PhD, it's very unlikely that you'll actually be assessing persons for mental disorders or treating persons for mental disorders. But this doesn't mean that your job will have no connection to persons with mental disorders. As I mentioned, mental disorders are overrepresented amongst persons in the justice system compared to the general population. If you are working as a probation officer, it's likely that you're going to have clients with mental disorders. If you're a defense counsel, you're going to be working with clients who have mental disorders. So it's not just that you'll maybe need to navigate their defense, but also navigate the communication with that client, understanding their needs because of the mental disorder, the symptoms that they're suffering with. If you are a police officer, as I mentioned, you're going to be dealing with calls to service that involve mental health calls as opposed to calls about a crime in progress or an investigation of a crime that's been perpetrated. So developing the skills to understand, okay, is this person not following my instructions because they're antisocial, they want to bring harm to me? or a harm to themselves or to society and the reason for their disregard of my instructions is because they have a they don't like law enforcement or are they having a difficult time following your instructions because they're a person with a mental disorder and they're going through hallucinations or delusions and they're not necessarily a danger to yourself or others they just have a difficulty following instruction another reason to care about mental disorders from a criminology perspective is because such individuals when they're in custody are at risk of victimization in a number of ways. So they can actually be physically assaulted by others or bullied, threatened by others. They might be seen as an easy, vulnerable target. But people with mental disorders can also be used by others in the custody center to fight other inmates or to assault a staff member. You know when I talked about kids with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, this also applies to adults, but they are very likely to listen to and follow the instructions of their peers. And so some peers can take advantage of this person and tell them to do certain forms of antisocial behavior, assault other people, assault staff, set off sprinklers, do vandalism towards the institution, all for the purposes of somebody else's entertainment. So as a staff member working in the custody center, you understand that the person has a certain mental health problem. You might become aware that they are more likely to experience victimization, so maybe you watch them more carefully, monitor more closely their interactions with peers, and so on. And lastly, antisocial personality disorder, which I haven't talked about too much today because I'll be talking about psychopathy in two weeks. Antisocial personality disorder the way that we define it is not the same as the way that we define psychopathy. They're meant to kind of capture the same thing according to the DSM. The DSM basically says antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy are the same thing. But in actual clinical practice and in actual research, they're assessed in much different ways. Sit and drink and
for this week's lecture involves looking at how mental disorders intersect with the processing of such persons through our justice system. And I think this is a very important theme to address because I know that many criminology students are interested in law school. So regardless of whether you're interested in being a defense lawyer or crown counsel, understanding how mental disorders impact the administration of justice is very, very important. I'll emphasize distinguishing between two key processes during the court adjudication experience. Unfit to stand trial and NCRMD. Unfit to stand trial has nothing to do with a person's mental health state at the time that they committed the offense. We focus on a person's fitness to stand trial because a fundamental aspect of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is the ability to communicate to our defense counsel the best possible defense against the crime that we are accused of. And if we have a mental health disorder and are unable to communicate properly to our defense lawyer, then we're not able to basically invoke that right to the best possible defense. You can tell that it's important because section two of the criminal code comes right out and says that an individual is unfit to stand trial if, because of their mental disorder, they're unable to understand the nature of the proceedings. You have to be able to understand the nature of the proceedings to be able to inform defense counsel of your best possible defense. Same thing about understanding the consequences of the proceeding. So if an individual doesn't understand what their punishment means, maybe they're just going to plead guilty to get the process over with. And they don't actually understand what it means to be pleading guilty to first degree murder that could result in a life sentence. So again, they have to be able to communicate to counsel their thoughts on different things. Very importantly, just because somebody is found unfit to stand trial doesn't mean that they're just released back into the community. If someone is found unfit to stand trial, there's a review process. The case is reviewed by the courts every two years to see if the person is now fit to stand trial. During this period of time, the person found unfit to stand trial is under the purview of a review board. The review board can give the person a conditional discharge, which says that while you are found unfit to stand trial, you may live in the community, but you have to abide by such and such rules. If you fail to follow those rules, then you can be detained. If a review board believes that community or conditional discharge is not suitable, they can just automatically go to detention. It's not detention in a custody center, it's detention in a psychiatric facility. You can only detain someone in such a facility if you believe that their living in the community would place risk to the public. If a person is found unfit to stand trial, so we have an actually an example of this in the Lower Mainland, an individual had perpetrated an offense and had no form of mental disorder, but while they were held on remand, awaiting trial, remand is what happens if somebody is denied bail, they are sent to pre-trial detention while they await their trial and the outcome of their trial and sentencing. This individual that I'm talking about was severely assaulted while on remand. The assault left them with severe permanent brain damage. So they were found unfit to stand trial. They were basically like rendered, I don't know if it was paraplegic, but they were confined to a wheelchair. They would be that way for the rest of their life. And the brain damage was irreversible or irreparable. The review board can find them unfit to stand trial. And then rather than the conditional discharge or rather than detention, they can order a stay of proceedings. Basically saying this person is not going to uh, put the public safety at risk, so we will just abandon the trial, abandon any form of criminal justice system intervention altogether. Unfit to stand trial is different from NCRMD, which focuses on a person's state at the time they actually committed the offense. So to be found NCRMD, obviously a person has to be found to have a mental disorder. Very importantly, just because you have a mental disorder does not mean that you will be found NCRMD. So the key is whether or not an individual is able to appreciate the nature or quality of their actions. A person may be able to understand what they're doing, but, but might not know that it is wrong. 
we can look at persons who are in states of hallucinations or delusions and actually did not know that what they were doing. Or we can look at a person's behavior, understand that the person was conscious that they were engaging in this type of behavior, but that person simply did not know that what they are doing is wrong. So the Vincent Lee case would be an example of the latter. Vincent Lee knew exactly what he was doing when he perpetrated the homicide of Timothy McLean, but he believed McLean was an alien and did not know that what he was doing was wrong. The causal nexus we'll talk about in a slide from now, but first I want to just briefly mention the actual procedure to find somebody in CRMD. The NCRMD procedure is specified in section 16 of the Canadian Criminal Code. Basically it says that a person will be found in CRMD if they're found to be suffering from a mental illness and that this mental illness made that person incapable of appreciating what they were doing or knowing that that action was wrong. The burden of proof is on the party that raises the issue. The presumption is that nobody suffers from a mental disorder and everybody knows that what they're doing is wrong or everybody is able to appreciate the action that they're taking. The onus, again, is on the party that raises the issue. So typically this will be defense counsel, but sometimes both defense and crown counsel can issue a joint statement to the judge saying that they believe that the person before the court should be found in CRMD. They have to show on the balance of probabilities that the person had a mental disorder that they did not know what they were doing or they did not know that what they were doing is wrong. When I was an undergraduate student and then a year after in the year following my graduation as a criminology major, I worked at a law firm that dealt with a lot of criminal law. So the defense counsel, one of the persons that I was responsible for like shadowing and being mentored by, he had a client that was suffering from schizophrenia and attempted to kill his mother. He placed a bag around her head, began wrapping a cord around the bag to try and suffocate her. His mother, fortunately, family members intervened, and although like extremely traumatic, it did not actually uh, result in physical harm to the mother, but police were called and police recommended charges to Crown Counsel. The lawyer I worked for told me that it was possible to raise an NCRMD defense in this case. The client had a mental disorder, was suffering from symptoms of that mental disorder, and might not have known that what they were doing was wrong or were not aware that, of the act that they were actually engaging in. But he explained to me that the NCRMD procedure can be extremely onerous to the client. Being found NCRMD could result in placement in a psychiatric facility and speak with the client it was actually in their best interest to proceed with the criminal justice processing as opposed to going the NCRMD route. So I have no idea about the ethics of this, but essentially one of the things to consider was what if this individual is found guilty, what would actually happen? Would the person actually end up in custody to begin with and would it be a longer period in custody compared to the amount of time that they would spend in a psychiatric facility the family was supporting the offense. the family uh, it's actually really bad the client was released on bail which means they're released prior to their trial with conditions and for someone that's committed a violent offense one of the like common statutory conditions is that an individual is not to have contact with the victim of the alleged offense. So in this case, the client was told in court by the judge that they were to have no contact with their mother. I arrived to the courtroom when the client was about to enter their guilty plea. There in the courtroom, fortunately, before the judge had arrived, the client was sitting on a bench right next to his mother having a conversation. So this was in direct violation of their bail condition. And if the judge had walked in, the client probably would have been taken right off the jail because the judge would have perceived this as the client essentially flaunting the rules of their bail. The client wasn't doing this because they wanted to be antisocial and they wanted to sort of throw their respect for the justice system out the window, so something to prove to the judge that I don't care about what you have to say, I'm gonna not follow your rules. 
This was just a client with severe mental health problems, also a bit of a language barrier, and simply did not understand that no contact doesn't mean like you're just not allowed to physically touch that person. No contact means you cannot talk to them, you cannot send a text message to them, you cannot phone a friend and ask that friend to tell your mom this certain piece of information. I think this story is important to point out because it helps students understand that when they have clients with mental health problems, especially serious mental health problems, how you communicate with that client can be very key. You may have to change the language that you use to help ensure that they have a really strong understanding of what is actually happening in court. Otherwise, there would be, in this case, not just concerns about NCRMD, but concerns about fitness to stand trial, because they might not even understand the possibility of punishment. They may not understand that these sets of behaviors would result in them becoming under further uh, conflict with the law. So let's say that the lawyer that I work for had decided to proceed with an NCRMD defense. What we see here are the three things that must all exist simultaneously, we call it the causal nexus, for an NCRMD defense to be successful. First and foremost, individual must have a mental disorder. So this is something that would require defense counsel hiring a psychologist to assess this person and give their opinion on whether or not the person has a mental disorder. And of course, Crown Counsel could call a rebuttal witness, another psychologist that maybe has also assessed the person to give their perspective on the person who's charged before the court. If a person is found to have a mental disorder, the next step is to show that the mental disorder symptoms were actually linked to the crime. So it's not enough just to say that the person had a mental disorder and the crime occurred. The symptoms of the mental disorder actually have to be directly linked to the perpetration of the crime. And then what has to be shown is that if we were to take the mental disorder away, the crime would never have occurred. So those are the three things that need to be established. And then of course, establishing that the individual did not know what they were doing or did not know that what they were doing was wrong. Just like rules about unfit to stand trial, individuals that are found in CRMD are diverted to a review board per the Canadian Criminal Code. And this review board consists of a judge and four other members consisting primarily of mental health professionals, one of them must be a psychiatrist. The goal of the review board is to basically assess the accused's mental state and design a disposition that is going to both protect the public and benefit the treatment of the disorder. So again, this is all once an individual has been found in CRMD. Canadian review boards then have to figure out what will be the response to this person. Are they going to be released to the community or are they going to have specific conditions in the community or do they need to be detained in a psychiatric facility? One of the options is a conditional discharge. And if that happens, they're released to the community, but they have to abide by certain conditions. If they fail to abide by those conditions, then they can be ordered to be detained. And a new hearing must be held within 90 days, basically to reassess what is the most appropriate response to this individual. R versus Winkos, it was established that if an accused is found in CRMD and does not pose any risk to the public, so no public safety risk whatsoever, they must be given an absolute discharge. Remember, the court has determined that this person was not responsible for their criminal behavior whatsoever. And if they pose no risk to the public in terms of future harm, then it is unlawful to detain that person or assign conditions to their community release if they weren't responsible for the behavior and they pose no risk to the public. So in such cases, an individual must be given an absolute discharge. And the option for an absolute discharge doesn't just appear at the point in which an individual is determined to need detention or a conditional discharge. A person can be detained and then there can be that review after 90 days. And then they could say that while this person has been in the detention center, they have responded well to treatment. They've shown no animosity or aggression, aggression towards staff. They have had planned trips out to the community where they've followed staff instruction and performed well. 
and therefore it is necessary per law to grant them an absolute discharge. Again, this is only if there is no public safety risk. A really valuable and important study that colleagues in BC have worked on is the National Trajectory Project that's looked at how persons found NCRMD are processed through the justice system and their future involvement in the justice system. The public, and I understand why, I understand why the public can feel especially frustrated that persons that have committed particularly serious crimes are all of a sudden just given an absolute discharge. I really empathize and understand with people who are very fearful of someone like Vincent Lee returning to the community after having committed such a horrific crime. But I wanna also talk about some misconceptions that are maybe common amongst the public and what the reality is. So one misconception is that people are being found NCRMD all the time. The reality is that it's only used in two out of every 1,000 cases that come before the court. So that's 0.2% of all cases. Of those cases, of the 0.2% of cases, only about 25% of them are successful. So if we break that 0.2 down further, it's actually 0.05. Extremely, extremely rare for such cases to actually result in a successful NCRMD defense. And not all the time are these NCRMD defenses instituted in examples of really serious offenses. Only about 15% of NCRMD cases involve someone that has been charged with a homicide offense. Another potential misconception from the public is the idea that people can drink and drive and then use their drunken blackout as an excuse for the perpetration of the offense because they did not know what they were doing. But automatism in Canada has been established as a definitive, unusable justification for NCRMD because the person knew that what they were doing was wrong. They knew that if they drink alcohol and get behind the wheel, they are a risk of themselves and others. Therefore, they cannot meet the definition of NCRMD. Maybe one of the more important things to show people is that Rarely do, be, do people found NCRMD become re-involved in the justice system. Only a fifth of all people who, who are found NCRMD actually recidivate. So that's it for the lecture. Hopefully that was valuable for sort of showing you what the definition of a mental disorder is, three of the more serious forms of mental disorder, how mental disorders relate to involvement in offending, and how the justice system responds to persons with a mental disorder. There's a video that you're required to watch for this week. It will be on the exam. It's called The Man Who Hears Voices. It's been made available on Canvas, and it's very valuable for showing different people who've been found NCRMD. Jeffrey Ehrenberg case is quite interesting because it definitely does not invoke a lot of empathy from viewers. Somebody who's committed a homicide doesn't seem to show much remorse for that homicide, yet is li living free in the community. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in our tutorial discussions for this week. You were waiting outside for me in the sun laying down to soak it all in before we had to run I was always ten feet behind you from the start didn't know you were gone till we were in the car oh the glory of it all was lost on me till I saw how hard it'd be to reach you and I would always be light years light years away from you light years light years away from you I saw your mother last weekend 
from you. 